Welcome to another edition of the Business and Personal Podcast, where we bring you closer to the people you do business with. And uh, we're really going to touch the personal side as well as the business side today when we talk with Jordan Levin of CrossFit Bloomfield. Uh, very inspirational. Uh, we could all use a little inspiration right now more than ever. And I think you're going to really enjoy his story. So Jordan, thanks for joining me on this snowy April Wednesday. How are you doing? <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, and I uh, I actually like snow. It has been crazy, and you know, with everything going on, it's okay to have a little bit of a change in the weather. You know, who cares if it's warm or cold? It's Michigan, you know, that's what happens. You know, so, know what I mean? So this gives you an idea, folks, of what you're going to get today. You're getting a smiling, happy person that uh, when we have snow here in April, not a lot of people feel that way, but that gives you an idea <laughs> of Jordan's perspective on life. So uh, Jordan, tell me about, uh, you know, I, I read your story uh, online and was just amazed really from birth till now you've had nothing but challenges come your way in your life. So I know that's a lot to unpack there, but just give people an idea of how you've overcome obstacles in your life to get to the point where you're at now. Uh, it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so the best way I could explain this is keep a quick, simple, readers digest version of my story of what actually happened in the beginning. So I was born three months premature, 11 inches, and 31 ounces back in 1976. This is before all of the technology. And at that time, they did not have hearing tests at that time. So when I was born, it was such a traumatic birth for my parents. And because I was such a preemie, I was in the hospital for the first four months of my life. And I had multiple surgeries during that time. And even when I was born, I was only given a 10% chance of survival. And the doctors said that I would probably have numerous of conditions growing up. So the focus from my parents became focusing on my physical development. So because they were so focused on that, perhaps they missed the hearing portion. If they really didn't find out about my hearing loss until I was two and a half years old. So when you think about that, a normal kid will hear and speak during that time. I did not have any speech or hearing. So the devastation of my parents being told, your kid is deaf. So well, that's a very complicated uh, thing to fathom and understand. So when they found that out, they basically said, okay, well, what are the options? My parents were told different options. And one of the options they thought they would have to go was the non-hearing route. And my parents said, you know what? Well, what can we do to get Jordan to be able to talk and listen? And keep in mind, when someone is deaf, there are different levels of deafness. I happen to have a 10% residual hearing left. So we were able to put hearing aids on me to help amplify those uh, the 10% hearing. What I'm getting at is that at that time, my parents said, okay, what are we gonna do to make this kid as normal as possible? And I always say to kids to find normal because everybody is unique in their own way. So I really don't like to use the word normal, but you get, you get the joke. What I'm getting, so here from this point on, my parents said, okay, let's go. What are we gonna do? One of the first things that they did was, well, a lot of the doctors and experts at that time, when I was two and a half years old, said I would never be able to speak. I would never be able to listen. And they were like, okay, they didn't like that uh, diagnosis. So the, the story goes that my dad said to two experts who were more positive about options. And he said, if I was Henry Ford and I had all the money in the world, what could I do to get Jordan to speak and listen? From that conversation, it led us to a conference in Toronto, where when they were in Toronto, they heard a speaker 
and the doctor got up in front of the room and said, if your hearing impaired child cannot do something, don't you believe it? That became the mantra from that day forward. That's so inspiring, man. And sports was a big part for you of overcoming obstacles, finding your purpose. Just uh, talk about uh, at a young age and up until now, and we'll get into your business here in a little bit, how impactful sports was for you throughout your life. I love that you asked me that question because sports for me was an outlet. If you back up a little bit, because there was so much focus growing up on learning to listen, learning to speak, and trying to be in a kid in elementary school, trying to be in class. But remember, I did not have any understandable speech and I could not hear. So what my parents did is they, my mom, at the end of each class in elementary school, would go to each teacher and say, hey teacher, what do we do today? Write the notes down. At the end of the day, we would then go home and do all the homework, all the assignments that we did during that day in the school. Again, and again, and again. Going back to what you were asking about sports. We would do all the homework stuff, but I still played sports. My dad was so good at time management. Not only did I do my speech lessons, did my language lessons, you know, did my learning to listen, but I also played hockey, baseball, water skiing, snow skiing, tennis, I mean, you name it. And what my parents always wanted, and by the way, I just learned some of this very recently because I've been having conversations with my parents about all of this, and I wanted to understand what did they actually do? And the whole purpose of them was to let me be with the kids and do all the normal activities that every other kid did. And give me an example. If I had a hockey game or baseball game, time management was the name of the game for us. My dad would be driving with a textbook in his hand, me in the passenger. <laughs> he would be quizzing me on the material while he was driving. So that's pretty close to texting and driving nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> so, but also then I would go to my own game. I would have a game, I'd play whatever it was, and I went back. It would be 10 p.m. Now get this. I just found this out. I didn't, I don't remember this. Apparently, we used to stop at McDonald's and get food on the way home. And again, textbook is open, I'm eating. He's quizzing me on the material. We would get home because I never slept. My parents took advantage of that. And we would still continue to do uh, speech lessons, the homework, or all those things to 11 or 12 o'clock at night. So I didn't realize the time frame of the amount of dedication that it took for my parents to do that, just to get me to be like everybody else and go out and play sports. Textbooking and driving. That's a whole nother thing I'd never heard of before. Quite interesting. So uh, obviously you had a great upbringing there, great support from your family. Um, just like me, 1999 Michigan State University graduate. So uh, you make it through college, um, certainly battled all these obstacles to get to that point. And at the end of college, you thought, oh, I'm going to get into real estate. And that didn't last very long. What caused you to change course on that to what you're doing now? So when, my, uh, when I, uh, I lived in Miami back in uh, 2000, 2004, 2005, and um, long story short, I, I moved there. I ended up working in retail. I worked for Target. I was basically an overnight manager in training, and I learned you know, all the ins and outs of retail and realize retail is not the best thing for me. I've always been an entrepreneur and I knew I wanted to always work for myself. So I was in South Florida at that time. I stopped working for Target, got into, uh, got into real estate and uh, got my real estate license. You know, I learned everything I could. 
but it was a very hard fear to have to be a hustler in a very aggressive way. And not that I'm not aggressive, I'm aggressive, but in South Florida, it's very multiculturally diverse. And for me, you know, trying to understand and navigate that, it was challenging. And then, so basically I was in Miami for one year and I said, you know what, everything that I do is in Michigan. This is my hometown. I miss my family, I miss my friends, I miss all of my sports. And that's when I came back in 2005, went back to Michigan. So you wanted, you have this aggressiveness and you wanted to channel it in a different way and tell people where you're at now um, and how you've evolved uh, to what you're doing. Yeah, so um, after I came back in 2005, I uh, got my personal training certification and that fit right in because I love working with people. I love helping people and you know, people ask me, you know, what's my superpower? And one of my superpowers is I make few people feel comfortable. As soon as you walk in the door or I talk to somebody on a Zoom call, I can make everyone feel comfortable because I'm confident in who I am and what I do, but yet I try to meet people at their level. And that's where that comes into play. So for me, getting into fitness, me being so active all these years was, was a perfect fit. So then uh, I started CrossFit Bloomfield in October of 09 in my parents garage. And that was a, that was a, a heck of an experience. And I was here for about six months. And then I moved to a 1500 square foot facility um, in Bloomfield Hills. And then by uh, May of 2000, I'm sorry, October of 2011, I'm moving to our current building where we have uh, 4,000 square feet of workout space. And it has been absolute blast working with such a wide variety of clientele. Well, and then, you know, when you start your business and you, you put your business plan together, sure you didn't plan on a pandemic hitting, um, but for you, what the heck? That's just another challenge that's been thrown your way. So how have you adjusted and evolved since COVID? I, I love that question because I ask that question here on my uh, podcast too, because you learn all these different things of how people adapted and pivoted to the, the situation, especially when it's a completely unknown territory. So what we ended up doing is when we, when we got shut down uh, March of last year, it was a very devastating thing for me because, well, for everybody else, but for me, I didn't know where we were going to be going. I didn't even know if I was going to have a business and all these things. And the first thing I did is I literally gave out all of my equipment to my members. And I literally said, go, take it, get it out of here. So what we did first, that was a Monday when the shutdown happened. By Tuesday morning, 5.30 a.m., we were online on Zoom, running five classes a week on Zoom. Five days later, I launched an app that allowed me to program how workouts in this app along with video descriptions so that every morning our clients would get the workouts along with the videos. So if they could not do the actual Zoom class, they could actually do the workout on their own. And on top of that, when they complete the workout, I would get an instant notification on my phone. So allowed, it allowed me to keep up with every single person. And one of the things that I did during the pandemic was every Wednesday, I texted personally, texted every single one, one of my members, how's it going? What's going on? How you doing? How you feeling? Great, thank you. Thank you so much for checking in. So made it through the initial shutdown we put up and back up since uh, last uh, June and uh, we're making the best of it with everything we can. And uh, obviously it's still a challenge with people who are, you know, not comfortable being inside and all of these things. And, you know, we've been running some outdoor workouts and now that it's warmer, we can open up the garage and uh, people are starting to uh, come back. 
definitely not surprised that you evolved. That's what you've been doing your whole life. So that, you know, that makes perfect sense to me. And, you know, beyond just the CrossFit business that you have, you know, you and I were trying to come up with sort of the best title for the other things that you do, but I kind of look at it as like a life coach. So um, beyond just the personal training, the physical things, uh, what do you do to help people out on the mental side? Um, so I, uh, the screen froze. Uh, beyond just the physical things with your CrossFit business, how do you help people out on the mental side with some of the other coaching things that you do? So a great question. So um, one of the things that I, uh, is not just the physical aspect of coaching is I have got to, I have through the years gotten to know my clients not at a more personal level. So I get to understand you know, how they act and how they respond to different, whether it's a verbal, a verbal cue or a physical cue. And you start to learn and develop these, you begin to see these patterns in these individuals. And I've learned to take that and I know I've learned how to uh, help clients on the mental aspect of understanding that fitness is not just the physical aspect of working out. It's taking all the external factors. I can control what clients do in the gym, but I cannot control what they do on the outside. So I always tell everybody, take a look at these things. Your family, stress, kids, work. Are you drinking enough water? Are you eating properly? Are you, you know, managing these things? If you can manage all of these things properly, everything else will fall in place. If you have one or two of those things that are not in place, you're not gonna be able to do what you want. So the mental aspect of it is I try to teach people, not just in the gym, but you know, our online coaching aspect of the business is developing good habits. And developing good habits is a very hard thing to do. And my job is to help clients understand what does it take to develop those good habits and to be able to sustain the good habits over time. Yeah, it's so important to look at that whole picture, right? That you don't just work with someone in the gym, they walk out and you don't have any connection beyond that. It's a whole picture that they have to put in place. So what are some things that maybe you've seen over the last year? Have you seen um, maybe more stress, more depression with people than you've normally seen with all the challenges of the pandemic? There's already enough challenges in life as it is, but this last year, have you seen even a bigger toll that it's taken on people? So you skipped out again, repeat the question. So in this past year, you know, life is always stressful enough as it is. But this last year, with all the challenges of the pandemic, have you noticed people going through more stressful times than even normal, where your, your services are needed even more? Yes, actually, I have noticed it goes both ways. I've seen it both ways where people have uh, learned to slow down, see what's actually going on, and they've been able to excel. The other side of it is uh, people will, I've seen people kind of pull back and use the pandemic as an excuse not to do something. And my motto has always been never take no for an answer. So I've grown up with this whole concept of if something isn't right, how am I gonna solve the problem to get to where I want to go? So the, the lesson here is, is just, there's a lot of a mental aspect with this pandemic, and I'm trying to help people get out of that rut. And, and I know, I know people who are listening, it is not easy. But my biggest advice I have for people is you need to have a, a good support system. If you have a good support system, you will be able to ask questions. And don't be afraid to ask those questions to help you get to where you want to go and don't allow yourself to kind of pull back. Sometimes it's as simple as taking a deep breath, taking a step back, like you say, live in the moment. Don't look at the totality of everything that's going on. Just uh, have gratitude in the moment and build on that, you know? Um, so you've helped so many people, Jordan, if you could just share like maybe one success story that stands out of someone that you helped fulfill their potential and make them seem fulfilled in life. 
great question. Uh, my motto is always been, if I can help one person a day, I'm happy. And on that, on that token, I have worked with so many different people, whether they are overweight, and I've seen this massive change, or somebody who's been an athlete all their life, but yet let themselves go far by the wayside, and life got in the way, I've seen that person turn themselves around. And what am I here for? I'm here to give you the tools to get there. I'm going to coach you through that. And my uh, name of my podcast is All Good Things Start With You. And the reason why I love that tagline is because literally any action anybody takes, it begins with that person. You and I, as educators, are just here to help guide them. So, Jordan, I'm sure there's a lot of people interested in getting in touch with you and seeing how you can help them out. So there's a lot of different ways here, but let's start with the CrossFit Bloomfield. Um, what opportunities do you have there maybe for new members and how can they become a member? Great question. So for us, our uh, best way to get a hold of us, go to uh, CrossFitBloomfield.com, go to the uh, website and you click on uh, sign up for a free no sweat intro. The no sweat intro is basically a free consultation where I will sit down with you and we will discuss everything that you've done, previous workouts, previous things that worked well for you and things that did not work well for you. And then we will sit down, come up with a plan of action. And if you've never done CrossFit, I highly recommend that you do at least two to three private one-on-one -on -one sessions. The point of that is it is an assessment. Let us help assess, see where you're at on day one, and then you'll be able to measure your progress going forward. Everybody loves free. So why not? You got nothing to lose. You know, give it a shot and see if you'd be a good fit working with Jordan. Now, on the coaching side of things, what sort of things do you have to offer there and how can people reach out? Yeah, so uh, with my uh, speaking and coaching business, as an inspirational speaker, I uh, love to be able to share my story with other individuals, corporations, businesses, nonprofits. You can go to uh, jordanlovin.com. You could also go on there. You can see my podcast. You can see my coaching stuff. You can see my speaking stuff. Everything is on there. The main thing for coaching for me is, as I said before, helping you guys develop good habits. And lastly, how can they find your podcast? So the podcast is called All Good Things Start With You. Go to jordanlevin.com, click on podcast. You go in there, you can listen to it. You can watch it on uh, YouTube. Uh, twice a week, I've been going live on Facebook as well as YouTube. You can follow me on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, all those things. Well, very good. Again, thanks for taking the time and your busy schedule. I wanted to share your story with others. I know there's a lot of people struggling right now, and I feel like they should just have a conversation with you, and uh, that can be very uplifting. So uh, hopefully we help you reach more people here, Jordan. Uh, best of luck to you going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me on here. Best of luck to you, and we'll be in touch. All right.